messages from? Oh, I'm getting messages from Alex Merced. What? <laughs> My boy. <laughs> what up, y'all? It's Logan Marie Glitterbaum from the Green Market Agorist. I know, not the uh, beautiful face you were expecting on Mikester's page, for those of you who are watching us live. Um... You know, Mikester just uh, wasn't, he's taking a well-deserved break. And um, so we're going to cover for him tonight. And I am joined by Alex Flores to talk about the LNC. Hello, so hello. How you doing, Alex? Yeah. Doing Making all right. Up. Just uh I am in route to you know to on my way back home now. Um flew out of Orlando at about two o'clock this afternoon and uh got to Albuquerque at around eight. And uh yeah, just um now I get to drive from Albuquerque back home to Lakeside, uh up in the White Mountains where I live, and uh, about four hours from Albuquerque. Damn. That is uh, quite the fucking journey, to be honest. <laughs> this party, my party is worth it. <laughs> hey, I mean, you know, I just have to drive eight hours, and this is a normal trip for me, because I've lived in both Florida and Louisiana and travel back and forth to them regularly, so uh, kind of makes it easy. But... <laughs> Definitely, it sounds like you have a much uh, bigger trip on your hands there. But, yeah. you I, know, um, you left the LNC about Sorry, 2 o'clock, you said? Yeah. You, you said you left the floor about 2 o'clock? Yeah, 2 o'clock Eastern time is when I, uh, I headed to the airport. So, what did you think of the floor today? I, uh... I was kind of, uh, you know, I, I got to a point like yesterday, after, like late yesterday afternoon where I kind of like just ran out of fucks to give. I don't know. Like, I don't really know how else to put it, but it, it's like I hit this point yesterday where like stuff was going on and like we were starting to get into the elections and the people that were getting elected were not people that I wanted to see in those offices. Uh, um that part for me was, you know, at, at about that point, I was realizing that the insider, you know, for however much this party has an insider click, um, they, 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 they kind of took over the national committee over the last two days with their elections. Um, the people that got elected are very much within that group. Um, I'm very excited about our vice chair, though. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that it's somebody that came from outside the group. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it. I don't know. We had a few good uh, uh, wins. I mean, Mikester did not win his election, but holy shit, did he get way more votes than even, you know, than any anybody really expected, I think. And, you know, that's not a knock at him. That's a uh, surprise at how far the party has come. You know, I was proud to see that I know, at least in the Arizona delegation, that Mike actually received the same amount of votes that the winner did, that Joe Bishop Henchman did. So the fact that we had two openly gay candidates that were that tied for first in our delegation in Arizona. I mean, yeah, it's huge. Um, we're, we're definitely making big waves. And, you know, and then Vermin uh, won his spot. So he is on the committee now. Um, so, I mean, that actually secures his space in the party, you know, like more long term. And, I mean, he has been here for a while. He's been here since at least 2016. 
because you have yeah. to be a you have to be a member of the party for four years before you can even uh, get into that office anyway. So that was really amazing. So Vermin Supreme is now part of our party. <laughs> um, what happened like yesterday and today as far as like bylaws and platform and stuff? I mean, that was. So I. I was going to say. The only vote that I really heard about was the CNI. Like yesterday, I don't think we did. I think the most that they did with the platforms and bylaws had to do with how we were supposed to do those elections. And uh, most of the changes that they made were things to try to speed up the process um, from what we would normally do. Because normally, you know, we'd handle one election at a time and we'd go ballot by ballot until it was all done. Um, with these, we were actually doing nominations in between and we were actually running the ballots concurrently with like the secretary and the at-large race. Um, so it was, that part was interesting to see. I've never like seen how that was going to go before today. Um, I was, I wasn't very impressed. I, uh, I know that it's, it's obviously going to take a lot of working out the issues for it to be, if they're going to do that in 2022, it's going to need a lot of work before it's ready. But, um, I'm overall definitely optimistic and excited. Um, I, I always go to these conventions. They're kind of like a, they're kind of like a, you know, like a, uh, reinvigoration for me you know they you know, I go to a convention to go to team up and network with people and I made some connections at this convention that there would have been no way that I would have been able to do online with an online Damn. convention it just wouldn't have happened you know I sat and had dinner or you know I had dinner with uh, um, certain you know different individuals that um, you know I to make connections for different organizations, um, was able to stay up late last night and uh, drink some whiskey with our presidential candidate, which I've never in my life known a presidential candidate who wants to sit and drink bourbon or whiskey with me while we sit and chat about the issues of the party and what's going on. So right, um, that mm -hmm. part ha has been really impressive for me that, um, you know that the amount of access that our candidates have to just regular people you know um and maybe that's not the right you know regular is not the right word but like i don't know i kind of feel like i'm just i'm rather somebody insignificant you know i just am somebody who works within the party to try to build it up internally and i'm more of a behind the scenes guy so for somebody to take five minutes to want to talk about an issue that means something to me was like was huge, that was like, more than five two minutes. hours well, yeah. that's what I mean. That way for somebody take even five minutes would mean would be huge. Like if 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 Trump or Biden bothered to take five minutes to talk about Native American um, sovereignty issues, I would be thrilled. I would be through the moon that it was getting any attention yeah. at all. Um, and they don't. They completely ignore it. It's nothing in their platform that has anything to do with it. They don't care. And. The fact that Joe Jorgensen, not only did she care and took my question in a room full of people who were asking her questions, but after that, sat down with me for like two straight hours until three o'clock this morning talking about all of those issues. Um, so that, to me, is a yeah, she huge made it until they kicked like us if, out. <laughs> yeah, if I would have, you know, if I had brought those issues to this part, Oh, now we lost him. Oh, seems we lost signal for a little bit here. He is driving, so uh, like, oh, there we go. Out of the room. Oh, we lost you. Come back a second there. Yeah. Okay. You're back. It 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 might get a little dicey through here. I'm kind of like, yeah. Um, I was I was just saying that like if I had brought these issues to the Libertarian Party 15 years ago, they would have booed me out of the room. You know, the Randian crowd would have told me, you know, would have just shamed me out of the hall. And the fact that I was able to talk, every delegate and candidate and member of the LNC that I talked to about Native rights and forming a Navajo Nation Libertarian Party, 
everybody was completely 100% on board. Um, yeah. Like Joe was then to, on board, she was taking notes. That was the yeah, that, part. Like she was so on board that she sat there and took notes and, you know, she sat there and, and was, you know, talking into her phone and, and making sure to jot shit down. And that was when she was talking to you. That's when she was talking to me. And I mean, you know, people forget that. And she remembered that this is the party that Russell Means came in second place to Ron Paul. You know, thinking about the direction this party could have taken and the direction this party is starting to take is pretty amazing. And, uh, and that was, you know, even before Russell Means started the American Indian movement. It was after that point that he started AIM. <laughs> yeah. So, um, oh, I didn't tell you what happened today, actually. Um, while we were in the convention hall, I saw Joe Jorgensen again and talked to her a little bit more. And they have asked me to form a First Nations advisory council for the Jorgensen campaign. No so, shit. Yes. So I am forming a team this week that will be tackling native issues or sovereign, you know, the First Nation issues um, and presenting uh, or presenting solutions that the Jorgensen campaign will then be putting out to the public. Damn. See, that is that is a huge win i mean think about that last night you have a conversation with her today she wants you to head an advisory board on the issue that is a yeah. huge win in such a major issue and i mean if you think about yes. it this is the foundation of you know th this is like how we strike at the roots to deal, you know, to actually get to a libertarian society in this, like the roots of the analysis is, is decolonizing America is dealing with indigenous issues. And then yes. it's going to trickle up from there. <laughs> yes. So, so to see her, like, be to, to see her not only do that, but like, you know, she was uh, uh, also, you know, talking about trans rights and talking about, you know, be possibly being related to Catherine Jorgensen. Like, she was talking about, you know, prisoner rights and said she would watch 13th, which I really hope she does. Like, you know, we were talking about all kinds of shit. And, yeah. you know, for all the people who... Th you know, it's surprising because behind the scenes she has gotten a reputation of being a little bit less left friendly, but that didn't seem to be the case. And she knew a lot of leftist groups and seemed to be familiar with a lot of, you know, a lot of how they were useful. Like she knew about the industrial workers of the world. She, we were talking about the Black Panthers. We were talking, you know, like all these different groups. And the American Indian movement and all that, like, that's pretty cool. And to have a candidate that's all about yeah. Black Lives Matter and trans rights and is forming an indigenous, like, yeah, committee for indigenous liberation and issues, like, damn. Damn. Like, as much as. This is such a huge improvement for the party. Still there? Sorry, you cut out there. What were you saying? Oh, I was asking if you were still there. I was just saying it was such yeah, an I'm here. this is such an improvement for the party, and it's absolutely amazing to see the direction yeah. we're going on. So, what is the details as far as this advisory board, like? You, you're just gonna help her write her platform for the for these issues, write her talking points and such. Basically, yeah, we're gonna be 
So George Jorgensen's new theme for her campaign is real solutions for real people. Um, so she is going to be coming out with a campaign. You know, her her new approach is her, her approach for her campaign is going to be instead of offering libertarian ideals that are these abstract concepts that people have a hard time wrapping their minds around, if, you know, for, especially for people who have never even considered something like the non-aggression principle. Um, you know, libertarian ideas are hard for them to, to grasp and to like, you know, um, to adopt into their life. But um, she, her campaign approach is going to basically be offering real solutions, you know, to real world problems, to like what, you know, to average American problems. Like when, if you notice in her acceptance speech yesterday, she was talking about, um, what was it that, the, now I'm having a hard time remembering. Um, I believe, but it was, uh, something, you know, it was uh, that, that, the, uh, story that she was telling about that the gay rights issue and i'm trying to think of oh shit it was in her acceptance speech yesterday and i'll have to go back and look at it so i'm more studied up on what she said but um she instead of trying to offer libertarian platform ideas as solutions to problems like a lot of libertarians tend to do which Nobody, you know, a lot of mainstream voters don't really seem to understand. Um, when the, she wants to instead offer practical solutions, you know, like the practical step-by-step -step solutions of how we're going to get something done. So instead of saying something like we're going to abolish the ATF, you know, she talks about this. She will instead talk about the steps that she wants to take to achieve those goals to get towards that direction um you know things that she can either do through an executive order as president or things that she can uh, put lean on congress to act on um, and so her plan seems to be that instead of you know battling the the trump and biden narratives with libertarian ideas that she wants to actually provide real world solutions that people can actually, you know, wrap their head around and see that like, okay, I can see how that's going to lead to a more free world for us. And, you know, I think that balances well with what Spike's focus has been in trying to, you know, encourage more direct action and mutual aid, like him and Vermin, that's what they campaigned on. And right. you know, having Joe offer like practical legislative solutions to go along with that, I think is, I mean, that's a really good balance, to be honest. Yeah. You well, know, and, you're, and you're telling people or you're explaining to people like how you can achieve this legislatively. And then when you fail to do that, how do you put out in the streets? Yeah. And, and that well, is a good ass message. Well, and there's some of it that, like, I, I know a lot of it that she's talking about doing, even with the executive order, which I know that, like, is like a total assertion of democracy when, you know, an executive, per, you know, somebody in the executive role does that. But um, using it to retroactively go back and undo some of the things that have been done by executive order that have trampled on those freedoms. Um, I think would be a major step. And, and you know, it's something that you, you hear a lot of empty promises in campaign season. You know, you hear a lot of things that like, you know, oh, we're going to cut, you know, we're going to increase funding for Medicare or we're going to do all of these, you know, we, they promise all of these things that a president can never do. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so much stuff that, you know, these presidential candidates will say that they're going to do that, like, that they don't even have the legal framework for them to even make that possible. No, it's so, like Bernie Sanders, half of his shit that he wanted to get done is better, is more easily done in Congress than is the president. Right. Well, done 
I mean, like something like Medicare for all has to be Congress. It couldn't be something that he does in the executive branch on his own. Yeah. So, um, in our, you know, constitutional politics world, but, um, it's <sighs> what I saw overall this week was a sea change. And I knew that 2020 was going to be a catalyst. Uh, all of the things that have happened this year were going to be catalysts for major things. There are major changes that are coming. Um, and really right now we're on, we're, it's like a fulcrum I and mean, we're at a tipping point and it could really go either way. Um, and I'm really, really hopeful that about these candidates that we actually, we could have a possibility for it to tip in the right direction. And at very least we have a 2020 huge influence, uh, have a bigger, a much bigger influence on the narrative at very least. I mean, if we can even get 5% of people to vote for Spike and Joe, um, you know, even 5%, and we are on every ballot in 2024, we will have federal matching funds, we'll have the, you know, it's, it's, it's like normally we would be starting from a hole in the ground, and it's like instead of that, in 2024, we would be starting on an even playing field. And uh, that in itself would be, I mean, that's, it would save so much effort and work that goes into just getting on the ballot. Yeah. No, and I mean, that's when we start and uh, uh, start getting serious, but yeah, until then, it's mostly a soapbox. Michael I'm Morrison hoping. says real libertarians don't take federal matching funds. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And uh, it's interesting because I, I, we had a candidate in Arizona. His name's Kevin McCormick. He ran for governor. And uh, he was running on what's called a clean elections, uh, running a Did clean election yeah. race. And so in Arizona... I don't know. Can yeah. you hear me okay? So tell us more about this candidate. Okay. Yeah, his name's Kevin McCormick. And if anybody's familiar with it, he tried to run on what's called a clean elections campaign. Um, in Arizona, if you meet certain requirements that they've put into the state, you know, state code, whatever, and, um, then you qualify for public funds uh, for your campaign. Uh, but you have to, you know, certain like... Uh, qualifications in order to show that your elections are being funded and clean, uh, that you're not taking any money from uh, super PACs or uh, organizations that, you know, like dark money, basically. Um, and so he actually didn't qualify for that money. And um, subsequently, a few, it was a couple months later after that was when the Republican Party then sued our the Arizona Libertarian Party and got all of our candidates kicked off the ballot that year by invalidating our signatures. We didn't have the manpower or the resources to combat and actually verify the signatures in time. Um, and so um, while I understand the argument that libertarians don't use those funds, um, the other parties definitely use those funds and they use it to trample all over us and silence us. And so if that money's there and that money is going to be going to Republicans and Democrats anyway, why, you know, using that, those funds to level that playing field to where they can actually hear from us as well as the other two parties, you know, it's, I would love to be able to stick to an ideal purist libertarian platform. It would be great, but we'd never get above 500,000 votes and we wouldn't get the exposure that we need. And you know, it's, 
it's a hard thing. It's, it's really hard. If we had the support that was within the party, that we had the, the money and the financing that could compete with those other parties to where we didn't need those matching funds, that would be amazing. But it's just not that way. What do you mean? We're Coke funded. We have plenty of money. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I forgot. I'm still waiting on my check on that, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Where's well, my Coke check? That's why that's why we founded the uh, Libertarian Anti-Fascist Committee and the Libertarian Socialist Caucus is so we could try and double our money and get those Soros checks too. Yeah, see, I yeah, where yeah, I would love some of this, you know, political dark money that is supposedly coming into this party cuz I haven't seen any of it. I mean, yeah, no, if you look if you look at the party's national budget, you know, they're working with less than a million dollars. <laughs> like it's it's like so so underfunded uh, compared to the major parties. Sorry, did I lose you again? Yeah, I might have. Hmm. Am I on the stream by myself? Ah, here we I'm, go. I'm back. I have no clue why I got kicked off. Okay. So I was on it by myself there for a second. I wasn't sure what was going on. <laughs> well, I'm glad it left you on. That's what I was worried. The the hotel Wi-Fi just fucked around. Yeah. Wow. I had to upgrade it in order to make it like really do what I wanted it to do. But... But I'm glad it didn't kick you off, so the video still has some continuity. Yeah, you're. I mean, you'll you'll have some dead space there because I had no idea that I was still on. But <laughs> nah, you're good. Um. So yeah, what did what did I miss? <laughs> See, I'm trying to think where. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure where it would have cut out there on your end. Um, well, I know. I know. Oh, we're, we were talking about matching funds. Yeah. Um. It's a hard thing, you know, and I get the libertarian argument. Gosh, I get it. I don't want to take federal funds either. Um, but I've also been fighting that ballot access challenge for the last decade of my life. And I've fought both parties on it at this point. You know, I fought Democrats in New Mexico on it. I fought Republicans in Arizona on it. And they pull every dirty damn trick they can in the book to make sure that we are not appearing on any ballots. And so when you have a censored ballot that they control, I mean, I, if, you know, is it, does it make us evil if we take those government funds to make sure that our voice is on that ballot and that we're not censored? Yeah, I, it's a, it's a tough thing. It's, it's a, a you know, if you're standing on pure libertarian principles, then yeah, you're gonna call it evil and terrible. And oh gosh, we could we can't take that evil tax money. You know, that's that money was stolen from people. And I, I get all that, but if we don't do it, like we haven't been doing it, you know, we're, well, first of all, we haven't even been qualifying for it. But if we were to ever actually qualify for it and not take it, the yeah. money is going to go to Republicans and Democrats. They're going to take that money. They're going to use that money anyways. Where does that funding? That? Where does that funding actually come from? That comes from the tax revenue, basically. Uh, yeah. I believe that you are able to select election funding on your tax return. So um, and contribute a portion of your tax return to campaign funds, and they then distribute that money to parties that qualify for it, which for the last hundred plus years have only been Republicans and Democrats. So the argument there is why the hell would you want the Republicans and the Democrats to be the only recipients of your stolen tax dollars instead of giving libertarians a chance? 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's plenty of different ways you could look at it, and there's so many arguments that can be made about it, you know. And it's something that, like I said, Kevin McCormick, when he ran on clean election, it's a very similar thing, but it's more state based in Arizona. And it's but it was it was a very similar issue that when he was trying to run for clean election funds, he was getting a lot of flack from other libertarians telling him that he wasn't a real libertarian because he was trying to get federal money or he was trying to get government money for his campaign. Okay, but, Michael Morrison says, so Republicans and Democrats are rioting and looting. Should we join in that too? I mean, to be clear, Republicans and Democrats are not fucking No, they're not. Looting. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I've been out there marching. Um, oh, you know, he I, says the I've argument seen, is that no party should have stolen funds, and we, I do agree with that. I but, agree that. Uh, 100% I agree with that. And I'm not even saying I I necessarily I don't actually really have a stance on whether we should take funds or not, uh, you know, in that sense. I, I mean, so here's so here's the other part of it. That fund is voluntary. It's yeah. not something that they take automatically. Yes, your stolen tax dollars are going to get jacked anyways. This is a this is a way for you to choose where part of that money goes, um, and so. Yes, it's it's still going to get stolen from you, obviously, through theft, um, you know, through taxation. Um, but it's a it's a voluntary fund. You know, you do not have to contribute to the uh, to the election fund nationally through your tax return. It's an option on your tax return and you can decline or accept it by checking the box. Um, so people have volunteered that money and it's being funneled into the major two parties. So where it's voluntary money, I, I, I don't know. It's maybe that, maybe that changes okay, it. Maybe that doesn't make people. it. You convince me we should just take the damn funds. <laughs> That's kind of where I've been at, you know, because as much as I don't want to take government money, I'm tired of having to collect signatures in the rain and snow. And yeah. especially this year, like having to go to people's doors with masks and gloves on and hope that they'll sign my petition. It's not happening. Like it's it's just not. We've had to sue all over the country just to get ballot access relief because they've censored the ballot so badly that there's no realistic way for us to get on it this year in a lot in like 14 different states. So it's such a multi pronged problem. And they make sure that it's so completely complicated and it becomes this obstacle course every time that we go to put candidates on our ballot. Yeah, no, it's absolutely ridiculous. And I mean, even and it's, discour it's discouraging too to other candidates. I mean, like 2018, like I said, our whole slate, we had a whole slate of statewide candidates from governor, senator, congressman, um, county offices like we had a whole slate of state candidates for office for the libertarian party in arizona and they all got sued off the ballot and well, they're, because they're, they're, and then once they kicked them all off the ballot then the republican legislature went back and increased our signature requirements by 300 times what they used to be so and it was only us. It only affected the Libertarian Party. It actually lessened the requirements for the Green Party, and it kept it about the same for Republicans and Democrats. But for for the Libertarian Party specifically, because of the way the numbers worked and the way they worded the bill, it increased our signature requirements something like three hundred times what it used to be. Well, there's a reason why so many like left libertarians that are running for local offices are running as like Democrats under DSA or, you know, or running as Republicans, you know, with like Liberty Republican groups. Right. Like Austin Peterson going back to the Republican party, you know, saying that like he was never going to get anywhere by doing it through the Libertarian party. And, you know, there's been efforts to try to get him to come back, but those have been unsuccessful. And I, I just, I think we both agree with Michael. Yes, the Republicans and Democrats are both thieves and tyrants. Yes. Very, very much. Here, here. <laughs> also, apparently, it sounds like a 14th Amendment violation we were talking about earlier. Due process? I mean, yeah. I, if yeah. The argument could be...
be made for that. So if you are on Facebook, um, there's a man by the name of D. Frank Robinson, who is one of the co-founders of the Libertarian Party. And he was at convention this year, um, despite everybody freaking out, hoping that he wouldn't go because he just fought and beat cancer. Um, just got through chemotherapy, you know, just recently had some kind of, uh, oh, and had also some kind of heart surgery. I mean, the guy was at all kinds of high risk and was sitting right in front of me in his delegation, you know, the, the whole convention. But anyways, I like he, fuck it. You know, yeah. you know. he is a deep, I love, I did, I love some of the people in this party and their dedication, but D Frank Robbins, he had even wrecked his car the week before coming out to, to, um, you know, and he was going to drive out and wrecked his car, didn't think he was going to be able to go and ended up being able to get a plane and flew anyways and came out. And so, like, anyways, all that was to say, Frank to clarify Robinson. That uh, D. Frank Robinson is not quite a founder, but he w but was at the first national convention. Yeah. Well, I know he wasn't there in David Nolan's living room when they, you know, wrote everything. Well, it, I guess that's more what I think of when I think of the founders is like the people that were in David Nolan's living room who wrote the the original, you know, that wrote the original stuff. Not uh, I know the original convention in Dallas, the Dallas Accord is, you know, what people would consider the founding of the party. Um, I'm more talking about the, the that stuff that happened in David Nolan's living room. <laughs> but uh, I. Uh, Anyways, uh, Frank Robinson has talked a lot recently about, I mean, you, if you go on his page and look through his posts at all, you'll see stuff about him talking about ballot access issues and him talking about a censored ballot and what he has tried to do over the last several years to maintain federal standing to take the case to the Supreme Court and argue um, about a, you know, to argue the case for a censored ballot. And... Um, there's grounds and there's, he's obviously, you know, thoroughly convinced that that route would be a route that we could take. Um, his solution that he proposes is a, basically a blank write in ballot, but similar to what you would get as an absentee ballot. If you were overseas or you were serving in the armed forces, um, you get an absentee ballot with all blanks. You know, there's no party listings. There's no anything like that. It's just blanks, and you fill in the blank with the name of the candidate that you want. Um, he was wanting to push that nationally and has maintained the grounds in federal court to do it, um, you know, by filing as a candidate every year, and that way he maintains, you know, the, the grounds to file a federal suit for relief based off of what he's what he's proposed, but um, there, there's different, definitely different routes to go about it. I'm not sure why the party hasn't really taken that route up. I'm not sure if they just don't see it as viable. I know the party does have quite a few attorneys of different types at the helm. Uh, we just, you know, elected uh, a very notable tax attorney to our chairmanship. Um, and you know, Joe, I'll, I, that much I can give Joe Bishop Henchman credit for. He has worked and bought and brought about billions worth of tax cuts. Um, and so that, that kind of stuff is impressive. Um, and you know, I, I'm guessing that, you know, they've had legal people look at maybe what Frank's proposed. Maybe they haven't, maybe they just blow them off and don't give them the time of day, but What's the one party? Uh, what's the one party member who's running is uh, who's running for tax thief? Oh, shit, we lost. Yeah, damn. All right, well, it's just me for a second. Uh, but yeah, no. So the convention, it was interesting. Um, like I said, the Probably as far as Joe goes, hanging out with her yesterday, we ended up talking about like a lot of shit. And the main reason, oh, there we go. Hey, there you are. 
Yeah, it just dropped out of nowhere. That was weird. No worries. It, like completely, it, like the window just vanished from my browser. It's like what? Wow. Okay. So, anyway. Apparently, uh, Michael says U.S. Constitution says states are in charge of elections, but feds can enforce, for example, amendments. Yeah, I'm sure there are all kinds of legal arguments that can be made and taken to court. Um, and like I said, uh, Frank, I mentioned Frank because that's just one route that I know that's mentioned that he is very firmly convinced about and has said that he's maintained the status to file in federal court about it. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not sure what the best solution is going to be there. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I really wish it wasn't matching funds, but at the same time, if we get 5%, if say Jorgensen, you know, got 5% this year and ended up, we ended up getting matching funds in 2024. And we start out with, you know, I think it's something like a hundred or ten million dollars, some some crazy amount of money that we can immediately put into national amp campaign ads, um, where we've never been able to do that before. Like we've had, like Gary Johnson, the best that he ended up getting were some radio ads. Um, yeah. You know, that was, and I can go into why with the way that his campaign funding was handled but we won't go there um you know uh all to say is that you know obviously funds could have been handled better but we didn't have national ads we didn't have exposure like that even though we had a very well-known governor um a successful two-term governor on our ballot so um, you know, people, again, uh, we, you and I talked about this last night that like people knock Gary Johnson all the time as not being real libertarian or whatever, you, you know, Gary Johnson's a good friend of mine. And I, I, the stuff that he did as governor were far more libertarian than anything that's been done by any governor in his state since he held office. Um, you know, right now They've got Governor, what's her name, Gabby Lujan Grisham in New Mexico, who is like, not you know, very, yeah, so it, it completely not libertarian at all. So it's, it's like, yeah, you know, nobody, I, you know, obviously the libertarians are always going to disagree on who is a real libertarian, you know, you know, <laughs> you know we're always, you know, I'm, I'm the real, I'm the only real libertarian in the room and everybody else is not. So, um, Wait, you're the only real? No, I'm the only real libertarian. Yeah, see, so, um, <laughs> uh, you know, Gary's always going to get those kinds of arguments, but it's at at the same time, it's like, are we working towards a world set free? Like, and how is that going to happen? You know, a lot of people think it's going to happen with this big cataclysmic thing that happens all at once. I see it as being something that's slow and incremental and messy, and it's 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 going to be a very hard road to get from here to there because we, you know, it, it wasn't a straight shot to where we're at now. You know, it was a long road for things to get as bad as they are right now. Um, so a comment Michael said earlier that I think, uh, uh, you know, leads into another conversation I want to get into uh, he said, circular firing squad, so quick to criticize and even condemn our allies. Yes. So, question. Oh, my goodness. How do you think Bot Immunity is doing so in, the, uh, in, in the party? This you know, I, I, Could, love that, I love that Mike brought that up in his speech. Um, okay, so you went to last it, convention for context. Like, you and I both went. And that was the first year that the Libertarian Socialist Caucus attended a convention. And right. there was a lot of contention. There was some support. But there was a lot of contention. There was a, yeah. And, and I, this the, year? the oh, candidate, uh, there was a candidate that you guys ran for chair, or that you all ran for chair, I believe, that year, um, who was very controversial and i yeah i remember that very clearly and 
um, yes, it's definitely been a shift in the last two years to where, you know, libertarian socialists were openly booed off the stage, you know, like, or openly booed on stage, you know, two years ago to where now, um, Mike can actually talk about libertarian socialism in his message and nobody was booing him. Nobody. And, and there nobody were booed him. booing other candidates at times. You know, there was one person on the online and, and, you know, I don't know what happened there, but there was one person online that booed Mike, uh, Mike's nomination at one point. It was like, but that was about it, you know, like everybody else. And even today, like, uh, so there's a guy in Ohio. His name is Nathan Wise. He's running for LNC at large. Um, I'm, I don't know if he made it. I believe the last time I looked at the results, it doesn't look like he made it. But he is a member of the Mises Caucus. And I don't know if you happen to have seen his post. Like, you probably didn't. Um, on his personal page, I looked yesterday, or was it yesterday? No, it was today, actually, it was this morning. Um, was looking through his post, or his post had come up on my news feed, and he said, You know, the coolest thing I learned about at convention this year was povertarians. And mm -mm -mm. like that right there, of all of it, like, and then going down to read the comments, you know, this, uh, a neat, uh, I can't think of her name now. Canelli, Canelli or uh, Canelli. Somebody had commented underneath that that they enjoyed the fact that Mikester had participated in our pizza party via tablet. Uh, and, you know, when I had Mike up on the tablet and was walking it around the room with him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and underneath that, you know, there was a com you know, the, a comment thread started where they were talking about Mike and his activism. And, you know, he was, Nathan was saying, you know, he's like, for as much as I disagree with him about libertarian socialism, Mike sticks to his word. And Mike is a man of his word and his principle. And he sticks to his guns, you know, that he stays on message. And he is one hell of a committed activist. So it is amazing to me that, like, regardless of where people stand, whether it's left or right or, you know, you know and, you know, Libsock, or if it's, an, you know, Ancom, or Ancap, or no matter where people are doing this, they're recognizing the work. That, you know, nobody, nobody can knock what he's doing. Nobody is knocking it at all anymore. And that says something, you know, like his work is speaking for itself in that. Yeah. No, I mean, honestly, it was impressive to see how far Mikester got in this election. It was impressive to see how well his message has been received. It's been impressive to see how well just the message of libertarian socialism has been received in general, this convention, um, and how it's just become kind of a normalized part of the culture within the party now, there are still some people who are very much ignorant of it, but it's not as scary as it used to be. And you're starting to see some interesting like conversations. Um, you know, uh, uh, I thought it was funny. One of the tables had a bunch of Socialism Kills stickers and then had some Lysander Spooner stickers and had a, we all had an interesting conversation around the table about how how interesting and, and funny and contradictory that was. Um, and not because it was untrue, but because it wasn't specific and so it seemed contradictory. You know, because they were talking about a specific kind of socialism that Lysander Spooner very much is not. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> not that I disagree with either sticker, it's just the context. And, yeah. you know, it's kind of interesting, though, to see people start to reconsider the way that they frame these things. 
And it's the same thing with like hanging out with, uh, you know, hanging out with the boot boys and like their knee jerk anti communism of some of them and not differentiating between libertarian forms of communism. And, you know, I understand it. Fuck authoritarians of any stripe. <laughs> Period. Bottom unity. Yeah. And I'm really happy to see that bottom unity is increasing. And to see the amount of people support, like casually supporting Black Lives Matter this year. Um, to see, you know, uh, uh, just, yeah, the receptiveness of Spike and Joe um, got to just casually talk to both and hang out. And it was a lot of fun. So the question is, what do you plan to do with your newfound position on Joe's campaign? So I've already, I've already got a couple things in the works there. I've already talked to a few people about it. Um, the amazing thing is that it connects into work that I'm already doing. Um, and, and that's, that's the, that's really been the beautiful part of all the stuff that's going on right now. For me personally, um, that a lot of the work that I'm doing right now, uh, a lot of the positions that I'm taking on, all coincide. They all coincide with each other. Um, you know, before, uh, you know, since January, I have been the Arizona Libertarian Party County Development Chairman, and um, that basically. I'm the guy that is developing the undeveloped counties in Arizona and trying to get new Libertarian Party affiliates established in those counties. Um, nice. I have had a slow, slow work of it up until now. Um, you know, for the last several months, I've been working to try to network with people in Arizona. COVID has not made that any easier. All events that I was going to go to got canceled. Um, you know, all these different events that I was going to go to to put a table out and have exposure for the state party. Um, they just obviously weren't happening, you know. Um, everything was closed down. And um, so I wasn't really sure how to go about, you know, building the counties, you know, other than working with people that I had already know were established and, and want to do it. And so I uh, – um, was working on my local county, uh, which is Navajo County, um, and they actually should be ready to go to be a recognized state affiliate here within the next two months. Um, I was really struggling to try to figure out how to do that for the rest of the counties in Arizona that aren't ready yet. And um, then, you know, Jorgensen got the nomination. Um, her campaign team started forming. Uh, Joe Hopman became her field coordinator, which I've actually worked with Joe Hopman before through Gary Johnson's campaign. Um, and, you know, some, so some of the people that she has in her campaign, I'm already familiar with. And so Joe reached out to me and at first had reached out to me to be the Arizona coordinator for the Jordan campaign. Um, and so I got to work on starting to, you know, I guess, you know, put out feelers around the state and the different, uh, you know, like different digital venues, I guess, to try to to get some support for Jorgensen rallied up. And I'm, I'm actually getting a lot of volunteers that are signing up that are, they're not even people that are in the party. Um, you know, I'm getting a lot of Republicans and Democrats that are signing up to help out to get Joe Jorgensen elected. But anyway, um, the... Arizona coordinator position is going to have me working with libertarians and non-libertarians all over the state to rally around for Jorgensen. So those, you know, that with the county development is really goes hand in hand. You know, as I'm building up for Jorgensen, I will also be helping to build these counties in the same way. And so we won't just be building election support for this year that's going to fade in november but hopefully we'll be building the bone the, the bare bones of 
an actual structure of a political party here in Arizona or, you know, in Arizona so that um, when we do run candidates in the future, that they have local affiliate support um, and that we can run a, a, a more full slate across the state so that people are seeing libertarians on their ballots more. Um, mm -hmm. And so when they approached me today about the, about the first nations, advisory council um it really just kind of you know at that point it was just to me i, I you know i i see things as the universe kind of you know leading me down a path there and um it, it definitely helped me to realize you know why it was that i was even out there at convention like i i feel like if if convention hadn't happened at all and all I'd really gotten to do was to pay to go out to Florida to meet George Ogerson and Spike Cohen and talk to them for a couple of hours and then go home, it still would have been worth it. Man. Um, Cause at this point, like I said, you know, the, the first nation advisory council is now going to be something that is putting those issues out to a public forum in, um, in an arena where they're completely ignored, um, you know, especially with a candidacy like Joe Biden um, coming up from the Democratic Party, uh, most Native American tribes, you know, are very notoriously vote Democrat. Um, when you're talking about the Navajo Nation, it's actually a stigma among their people to step outside of that and to vote for a different party and to do it vocally is like to bring public shame to your family like uh, to stand up and be something besides a democrat is, is shameful and it's treated like something that like is you know makes you a terrible person um and so to be able to have people that are going to research it in ways that democrats aren't doing you know uh, they're they're not giving it the time of day other than you know different crony deals that they're making to screw over native american tribes and steal their resources um beyond that you know that they don't care and republicans really don't care and you know you, you're basically left with millions of americans that do not have a voice of representation in their politics at all. Um, and so really, all three of those things that I'll be doing over the next two years, you know, the, over the next six months and then, you know, more intensely with the state of Arizona over the next two years is going to, to bring a lot, you know, is going to bring a voice to those areas in a way that has never been done before um you know and it will give a platform to speak on about sovereignty about issues you know about taking it further than just offering a handout that is never going to be sufficient to improve their way of life um you know this is a real chance for them to talk about a real chance to talk about sovereignty and to talk about being able to use the lands in the way that was promised for hundreds of years so that their people can actually collectively work together and come and rise up from where they are right now because as it is right now, the reason why I took up Native American issues, for one, I'm Apache. Um, you know, I'm Mescalero Apache by heritage. Um, and for two, because I worked out on the Native, uh, on the Navajo Nation in 2018 when I worked for Gary Johnson's campaign, and I saw firsthand the plight of what is going on on reservations that nobody talks about. You know, one in three households still don't have running water or electricity and we're in 2020 that sounds like something that you would have heard back in the 60s you know that like we still have americans that don't have a toilet that works or a light that they could turn on in their house it's mind-boggling to me 
that that's still happening to Americans now, and there's nothing being, you know, there's next to nothing being done about it, and there's all of this federal funding that's supposed to be going to these reservations to help out. You know, like the CARES Act was supposed to send billions of dollars to the Navajo reservation. Well, they're just now getting to the point where they're even barely able to implement a portion of it. And it's not sufficient. It's not enough. You know, they're going to use it to start building water infrastructure, which is something they desperately need. But as of up until this year, it took a virus, you know, to put a crisis, you know, to the level of them, you know, getting the focus and having the funding sent their way that they've been begging and needing for, you know, needing forever. And yeah, prior to this year, the only thing that they've had are voluntary funds. They've only had, you know, like there's the Navajo Waters Project, which is something that I work with and endorse completely. If there's anybody listening, feel free to go check that out, NavajoWatersProject.org. It is a cooperative uh, initiative, uh, basically, where they are they have tribal leaders that have combined with volunteers in the Navajo community to provide running water and electricity to Navajo Nation homes that don't have it. Um, and so far, I believe that they've helped something over 200 families. Um, and they're trying to raise a million dollars this year to be able to assist 230 more families with having running water, electricity, a working sink, and a working toilet. And they've basically got this project now to, you know, this project has, they've worked, you know, they started out with one person with a water truck. Um, and they've built it from that to a, you know, they have a solid plan in place now to where for about for you know forty five hundred bucks, you know four thousand five hundred dollars, they in a twenty four hour time period can show up at a house, install running water, electricity, a sink and a toilet that work, and you know base you know completely change a family's life, you know in twenty four hours, but. There's no government funding that goes to it. You know, there's government funding that is available for these things, but none of it is ever, you know, none of it is utilized to help these tribes out. And because there's so much additional red tape from them being under federal jurisdictions, like the BIA, they, it's, it's impossible. It, it makes it almost, you know, nearly impossible to, um, to give to grant you know to give them the upward mobility uh, the, the ability to actually build for themselves and rise up out of their circumstances mm -hmm. so um, that's become my passion now that's that's what I work on and uh, you know that's kind of how they all kind of intertwine and connect together um, I thought I saw a comment pop up there I don't know I you know I've yeah. talked about Uh, oh, uh, Michael did say that he wants to talk to you, Michael Morrison. Who? Uh, I don't know. Some somebody named Michael Morrison who commented on here wants to talk. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, right feel free to add me on Facebook. My name is Alex Flores on there. Um, and. If you do add me, make sure you send me a short message to let me know why you're adding me. During campaign season, my inbox or my friend request list tends to be flooded constantly, um, and so I try to limit it to the people that I'm actually um, directly involved with or have met in person, so that I can um, focus on the the people that I need to work with. But um, like I said, if you send me a short message and explain why you're adding me, um, I'm more than happy to talk with anybody about getting this work done. Um, it's going to take a lot of people. Um, Michael take, Morrison says that you've been friends for years. Sweet. Well, then, perfect. Let's chat. So, <laughs> yeah. How dare you not recognize your friend? So... Again, you know, if we haven't met in person, um, I am terrible with names. 
Um, yeah. I can see a name and you can tell me what your name is. Uh, and unless I see a face in person and relate the name to it several times, it, it's, I have a very photographic memory. Um, and so it takes me a few times of seeing somebody and relating the name to them for it to finally stick. So I apologize. I'm not going to, you know, beat around the bush there. I, I, I'm shitty with names. <laughs> <laughs> Michael says, oh, I'm pretty insignificant. Nobody's insignificant. Come on. You were if if you manage to get on Alex's friends list, only the top of the only the cream of the crop get on that. I know because <laughs> I'm not on there. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's funny how many, you know, libertarians have talked, oh, I've seen you in chat, you know, and then they get surprised that we're not friends already. And I'm like, yeah, well, if you sent me a request and you didn't tell me who you were, then I probably declined it. And, you know, if I did accept it, you know, I probably saw something that you said that I really liked. But, you know, if we haven't had a conversation, then uh, I'm sorry, I probably don't remember your name. You know? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, this convention, though, bot immunity is really going really well. Um, we're seeing, you know, racial issues being actually paid attention to by campaigns. Um, you know, trans rights um, basically got Joe Jorgensen to say trans rights. Um, also, Oh, I, I still need to send you that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to put that on YouTube as Joe Jorgensen says trans rights. Like, I know that's not what she says, but that's going to be the clickbait title. But I'm going to have to put it on there. <laughs> um, I might, I, being that I actually work on the campaign, I may have to ask her if we're going to publish it, you know, I don't, just because I don't, I'm, I don't want to cause any uh, problems for her, you know, but um, I don't think anything that she said in there no, is bad. I mean, but, saw yeah, cameras I around there, too. People were filming her. Other people are going to put shit up, too. But, yeah, it is always good yeah, to true. ask. So, but I just know, so, like, they've had a lot of, it. yeah, they've had some internal issues with that campaign since it started up. Yeah, but I'm trying to make a meme yeah, of her because, to. you know, getting getting people to say trans rights is a meme. And honestly, now that you're working for the campaign, you need to get her just to straight up say trans rights. Just like those words. Because that is the meme in itself, and I love it. Yeah. <laughs> but the fact that she just, like... Drew on her possible relation, uh, her possible relation to Christine Jorgensen was pretty cool, and yeah, but she yeah. still never. You notice she still dodged the question about the fact that the correct pronunciary, the correct pronunciation is Jorgensen, not Jorgensen. Well, and. <sighs> What is she She's hiding? Definitely. I don't think it's really hiding anything. I think it's more that she uh, she didn't really want. I don't think she wants that to gain traction. You know, I think it's more what I it know. is. And so, it, and so in politics, you know, anything that you pay attention to is gonna is gonna gain more traction than something that gets ignored. And that's some that's a that's a strategy that you see the main two parties use on us all the time. I mean, they're doing it right now. That's why you don't hear about Jorgensen anywhere is because they're... She doesn't have dank memes. She doesn't have dank enough memes. I'm trying to help her make meme videos. Come on. I'm going to put this on TikTok. You know, I, I, you, know, I, you know, there was even an MSNBC poll that was done where they showed that 81% of respondents to the poll were considering a vote for her. Yeah. 81%. And so it's like the response is there, 
But they didn't put that on any newscasts. They didn't talk about that significant result that just came out of nowhere that they weren't expecting. You know, they're, they're not talking about it. They don't want to give it any credence. They don't want to give it any validity at all. And so they completely ignore it like it doesn't exist. And so you'll see a lot of polling online. You know, uh, uh, who's it going to be, Trump or Biden? You know, like they act, they will totally just act like no other choice exists. And that's, you know, if, you know, it's very effective politically because if you don't say your opponent's name, you know, saying your opponent's name is giving them free advertising, you know. Anytime, and Trump is some, Trump, some, Trump is somebody who capitalizes on that um, immensely. You know, in 2016, when we look at campaign finance, Hillary Clinton spent over a billion dollars trying to become elected president. Um, you know, Trump 50 million. Trump did outrageous shit and got to be newsworthy. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, a billion dollars her campaign spent trying to get her elected. You know, 50 million of that alone went to try to discredit Gary Johnson. And yeah. so, um, yeah, so she spent over a billion dollars. Trump spent like a fraction of that. You yeah, know, Trump he just had the media machine on his side because he was outrageous as fuck. Yeah, he only all he had to do was say outrageous. It didn't matter that what he said was going to piss off half the country because mm -hmm. it, even if they were pissed, they were mentioning his name and they were talking about it. And yeah. The people that don't care about what, it, you know, that aren't offended by the stupid and ridiculous things that he says are going to support him even more avidly, you know, and they're going to pick up, you know, and he's, you know, catering to all of those buzz issues that conservative, you know, that that whole alt-right conservative wing of their party has been like screaming, you know, it's like the... I almost want to call it the bottom of the barrel of the Tea Party movement. You know, like <laughs> it's it's not really because like because like you had people like Justin Amash in the in the Tea Party movement that like he got elected and has been the most libertarian senator or most libertarian congressman that I've seen. You know, besides Congressman Ron Paul, you know, he's he's there like and right now he is the first official sitting member of Congress that is a libertarian. So that's a first in our history. And like it's you know, we we get people like that out of the Tea Party movement, but then we also get Make America Great Again people out of that movement. <laughs> Trump ever a self identified Tea Party or I forget. What's that? Was Trump ever a Tea Party or I forget? It's kind of the it's it, no, I don't know if he ever personally was, but he kind of like what he was saying was a lot of signals, like I said, to the lower end of that movement, to like the what I would call like the bottom of the barrel of that movement. People that they don't pay enough attention in their in politics to really know what their senators or congressmen are doing, but they pay attention to the buzzwords and they pay attention to the to the uh, the clickbait and stuff and the, the things that they see on you know Fox News or CNN or uh, you know mainstream media is giving them their political talking points and they're not doing any further research. So um, that group is you know they're going to entrench themselves and vote for him even further and harder and camp you know and you know they call themselves that silent majority. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, it's, I'm trying to think where I was going with that. Um, I, so, it was more that, you know, I saw it, Trump definitely, like, I, I don't think he was a Tea Party, Tea Party here, but he definitely co opted the movement. Um, you know, I guess what, what, like, uh, what, what used to be the Tea Party movement is now, you know, MAGA country, like, <laughs> God, and 
You know what Joe really needs, right? Is a flag. She's already got the hat. She was distributing those there. Now she needs her own flag. Wait, a hat? What? She had hats. Damn it! Did you not <laughs> see the hats that were being that everybody was wearing? The white ones. Oh yeah. Okay. I did see you know, right. They were rather bland, honestly. Uh, and, and mainly, mainly because I don't like white stuff. Because I very easily stain stuff. And yeah. also, I'm just kind of a low key goth girl. But, you know, it's, I don't know. That was, they had some pretty cool uh, shit out. But yeah, all the campaign shirts and all the campaign hats were white, so I didn't get any. So I think the infighting in the party, right? Um, and how, like, it, it kind of takes away from the efforts of the movement because there's a lot of focus on internal division. Um, I think we, yeah, I think we had kind of started to talk about that. That's something that was really like, that had gotten to me this week and I actually got in a couple of people's faces about it because I was seeing things online that, um, you know, where people going into somebody's personal life and dragging it out into the public forum for no real benefit, honestly. Like I, you know, the stuff that was revealed. You know, and I'll say, and I'll talk about his name honestly because Josh is a good friend. You know, he's somebody that I've become friends with in this movement. You know, I don't agree with Josh's politics um, necessarily, but I can't argue with the man's work. I, you know, the recruitment that he's done in the last few years, like. He took it like he took his loss to heart in 2018 and went to work and became the number one recruiter on the LNC for new members. And so it it wasn't like he like took it and was like, well, screw you guys. You know, I, I know I'm good. But you know, like he went out to prove himself and, you know, whether it was for personal gain or whatever, you know, I don't see that like. Yes, there's probably a lot of it that he does personally gain from by bringing in, you know, more Mises Caucus members that are going to be dues-paying members to the party, and you know, it'll slam things more that direction or whatever. But it's it's everyone's job to bring people into this movement. Um, it's everybody's job. It has to be. We are so small of a party. You know, we have less than half a million dues-paying members nationally. Uh, we you work know, on things swing more paleo in the direction of you know that the Mises caucus goes doesn't that swing the culture further to the right which is something we've been trying to fight I mean granted the right. Mises caucus has been uh, the, some of the members themselves have been slowly like moving further to the left on social issues as we're as we're like communicating a little bit more but that's coming with that's coming with time and education. And so I think a lot of the worry is, is that given that traction, that that recruitment isn't necessarily what is best for moving the movement in the direction that it needs to go in a lot of people's eyes. Yeah. You know, and I'm not saying so, that like every single no. person Josh has recruited is like, Oh, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, like he's recruited some pretty cool folks, especially like, fuck. I mean, seeing a lot of the Mises folks be, you know, in their Hawaiian shirts, repping the uh -huh. fucking igloo and fucking supporting Black Lives Matter. So, I mean, now I am starting to see a shift in Mises caucus culture, mainly because I'm seeing a shift and luau culture. Well, and so I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about, you know, argue the other side of that and, and be like, and, and basically say that, you know, even if every single person that he recruited became a, you know, a right-leaning 
uh, Mises Caucus member, a paleo, you know, was it was a paleo that came into the movement and made things, you know, was, had things leaning that direction. Even if every single person he brought into the movement leaned that direction, I'm still all for it. Because like I was saying, you know, uh, I think we talked about this last night, but there's no perfect path into this movement. There's no straight and narrow that leads you directly to libertarianism. It's a dirty, it's a, it's a dirty, like, winding path for everybody. You know, nobody comes, you know, like very few of us are born into it. Um, a lot of us don't really grow into it for some time until in our adulthood. Like, and so it's, that's why I'm definitely about using this like party as a recruitment tool because, like I said, like electoral politics are not really my goal, right? Um, nor is it a lot of libertarians' goals. But um, no, I, I want a world set free in our lifetime. I just see, I just happen to take you know strategical, methodical approaches to it. You know, and people call that pragmatic or whatever. I've been called both. I've been called pragmatic and radical for my stances. Um, I, I don't really know where I stand, but yeah, um, but I, mean, I just I, I more look at it, and and that's what I'm loving about the Jorgensen campaign too is that um, it's solution oriented, you know, and that's how yeah. I tend to be. Like I, you know, we can talk about ideas all day, but you know, if we don't have a plan to implement it, it's not going to go anywhere. As far as like, I think that I think the only issue I think the only issue people have so much with recruiting because I. Because I agree, like, this is a recruitment tool, and this is a soapbox, and this is all that, so, in my view, so, I mean, like, uh, uh, I don't, you know, I love being able to reach out to people from across the aisle, and, you know, or, who, you know, from all across the political spectrum, and be able to, you know, find that common ground, lead them in, and... Yeah, like you said, there is no straight and narrow, but I think the issue that people have is if they, you know, if a lot more of those folks get control of the narrative and continue to warp it in the way that it has been warped in the past. Yeah. And we've been trying to reform the libertarian message away from one that is just Republican smoking pot. And granted, maybe post-Joe, it's not going to be that anymore, even with Mises, and that's not an issue. So, I mean, I'm, I'm agnostic to the solution to this. Like, I'm just playing devil's advocate as to... Well, and it's, it's funny that... Me, it's, it's funny that you bring up that Republican smoking pot line because when I came into the party, what was being told to me was the opposite. What I was told is that, you know, libertarians are Democrats that want to own guns. Um, yeah, and hate taxes. <laughs> Love guns and hate taxes. Right. And so it's like, you know, those are like these sweeping dismissive stand, you know, dismissive, whatever, you know, and absolutely, uh, I agree. But there's still a public perception that is there. There is still a public perception that links us to that links r the the Libertarian Party and a lot of the Liberty Movement to you know racist, sexist, homophobic views. And I'm not even saying that's warranted because obviously, looking around and and you know at this convention this weekend. It is not warranted, even among some of the more conservative members. I mean, yes, did I run into some folks who like were in, like admittedly homophobic? Yeah, you know, yeah. Did I run into some people with some like questionably like ignorant views on race? Yeah, but I also I also met a lot more people who were totally fucking cool with all that shit. You know, so I mean, we're outnumbering those folks, and that that perception is changing, especially with Vermin, especially with Joe, especially with the Bottom Unity campaign, the Libertarian Socialist Caucus, all this shit. You know, so I don't think the Mises Caucus 
you know, take over is the threat that people make it out to be. The, but I, I, I understand the worry of paleo take uh, of continued paleo takeover of the narrative as others are trying to reclaim libertarian roots rewrite the narrative towards social justice and liberation and you know strive for bottom unity like true bottom unity yeah yeah and and like like with the, the music caucus, like I, again, like if every single one of the pre, those people that are coming into the party were all the paleo conservatives, you know, that type, I would still be okay with that because what's that show? What that is showing to me is that he's doing the work, you know, he's out there and can bringing those people into this arena, and you know, not everybody stays there, you know, like. Even today, like I was saying, Nathan is definitely a Mises Caucus member, but he was giving a hat tip, an open hat tip on his Facebook to Pobertarians. Um, you know, and even I John... Mean, that's I, the watered-down version that was meant to appeal to people from across the board. And I mean, shit, right. you have Richard yeah. Spencer advocating Medicare for all. So, I mean, and I'm, I'm not trying to compare them to, but I'm saying that that type of, like... That type of jester doesn't really actually say much. I mean, when I have, like, when I said, and I actually, like, I had lunch with Josh Smith today, um, and we talked about that kind of stuff. Um, and it was interesting to me that, like, you know, Josh was saying that not only does he fully support the Pocketarian Caucus, but that he's donated to it, you know, the last couple, the last two. Um, it's like, oh man, you're cutting out the uh, that's like the bait that you know, bring. <laughs> there you go, you're back in, you're cutting out. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm now, I'm, I'm heading down the interstate. I'm almost to Holbrook now. But um, anyway, um, I, all I was going to say is that, like, it's it's showing me that they're doing the work for recruitment. They're actually, like, busting their ass to bring people into this party. And the fact that that whole, you know, there was hundreds of people that showed up in Florida on such a short notice just to come out there and support Josh. No, no. Oh, wow. Like, there you go. That's something that I can't tell me. Okay. You know, I may not agree on where they stand on everything, but I, I, if you look at where I stood when I first came into this party, I would not agree with myself from 10 years ago. Um, I, honestly, when you look, when we look at how far the party has progressed, how far even the Mises caucus has progressed, how, how much like, you know, like Josh still didn't win. Like it's, you know, he got close. Herman in office instead. So we actually do have an anarcho communist, in, you know, on our. <laughs> like, that well, is really awesome. And so, I mean, like, honestly, the paleos don't fully control the narrative anymore. Like, uh, one of our, you know, our vice presidential candidate. He's just a flat-out anarchist. I mean, all it really means to me is that the people that are on the left of this party got their work cut out for them. You know, they, we've got, you know, 
people on the left. The of the we're already slowly changing the narrative and that we've already seen major successes and that honestly, I'm, right. I don't think the Mises Caucus is the threat people used to make it out to be. You know, and, and still make it out to be. Like, I'm not saying some of the members don't have their problems, but honestly, I've met a lot of amazing people out of that, you know, caucus, too. Yeah, and, and I mean, you know, the, it, the, the cool it, part about it is I, you know, was talking to, you know, some of the people from the, that are actually leadership within the Mises Caucus today. And they are wanting to help Arizona get on, you know, they, you know, I was talking to them about my county development work in Arizona. And they're wanting to send me lists of volunteers of people that they've had sign up through their website so that they can help build these county parties. And it's like their list is far beyond anything that I've gotten as from the state party or Jorgensen's campaign even. Um, they have more people signing up to be libertarians as part of the Mises caucus than I have that are wanting to support George Ogan, or Joe Jorgensen in Arizona or that are wanting to be Arizona libertarians. So, like, it's, you know, that, to me, so that, that there's a definite, like, passion and hunger out there that they, that they are tapping into that we need to find something equivalent on the other side of things if it's a balance that we're trying to seek. You know, if we're trying to keep things on a balanced level you know, to where there's bottom unity and it's both sides working together and it's not being pulled in one direction, mm -hmm. then you know, the left side has got their work cut out because the right side is obviously putting in the work and recruiting people. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's the thing is like people forget that the libertarian, uh, like the libertarian party kind of formed out of that left-right alliance where it was anarchists and members of the old right coming together over their commonalities of like being anti-war, anti-drug war, you know. Right. Well, and I, 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 I and it's nice right. to kind of slowly see us get back to that, especially in a time where the state is getting as authoritarian as it is. And I see it refreshing that actually just anti-authoritarian tendencies from across the political spectrum are becoming more, like, prevalent. Because, like, now you do have folks in the DSA getting into office talking about abolishing ICE and abolishing the, or defunding the police and, you know, shit like that. Like... You know, you do have more libertarian Republicans, you know, trying to run for office and shit, and some that are in office. I mean, Thomas Massey, I have my disagreements with him, but I also have a lot of agreement with him, you know. And then, and then um, there's, you know, what Bill Weld decided to run, and Zoltan Isvan both decided to run as Republicans this year for some reason. I think Vermin is running as a Republican again, just as a joke. And because I don't, I know that one's not a serious campaign like his LP run was. And um, I think he actually might be prevented from doing that now. Yeah. Um, I know that if you are on the LNC, that you can't run under another party's political, another party's banner and remain on the LNC. Um, I I don't you know have if to. doing that or not. I mean, I've heard things. I, I've seen memes and shit. I don't know if it's happening or not. Like, I've seen memes and polls, but... Yeah. He has... The, um, you can't endorse a candidate from another party either if you're on the LNC. Um, and I know he made judicial committee, so I'd have to look and see what the rules are about serving on judicial. I know that judicial is very focused on being you know, fair and... Um, you know, whatever politics you bring to the Judicial Committee usually are kind of left outside of it because you're more of a body that is concerned with how the bylaws um, govern the organization and issues that are coming up that conflict with those bylaws. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, I'm sure if his campaign conflicts with anything with his new office, if he is actually doing that campaign and it's not just another meme. Uh, I mean, well, like I said, I have not been paying attention at all. So. Well, I, I hope he actually is. Um, you know, I hope he actually is you know, intending to fully serve on the Judicial Committee. Um, Oh, no doubt. I mean, I yeah. have no doubt that he has been really true to his word so far to the party, so I don't think he's going to bill weld on us. Yeah. Um, I just more mean, you know, I've seen a lot of people who, like, once they are, you know, once they win an election or get into the position that they were seeking, um, there tends to be a lot of, uh, yeah, you know, there there are people who then you know start to drop the ball on the job. I know I'm not saying that Berman would. I'm more just you know uh, most of his candidacies that we've seen up until this one have been satirical. Um, yeah, and uh, which I love. Like I love Berman. I hung out with him too in Arizona, in uh, Tucson in January. Um, we actually all hung out on Adam Kokesh's bus, <laughs> and. Uh, so, I mean, and, and there's another example right there of some kind of unity happening that would have never been possible 10 or 15 years ago. Like someone like Vermin, someone like Vermin Supreme, a candidate like Vermin Supreme, hanging out and discussing politics and just chatting and having a good time with a candidate like Adam Kokesh. Um, yeah, an ANCOM and an ANCAP, like... Vermin didn't trust libertarians a few years ago. Yeah. I mean, he's been in a party for like four years or so. So, I mean, it's been like four or five years he's been in a party. So, I mean, at least that long he's been cool with them. But, like, it took a while. Yeah. It took a while. And, I mean, I get it. A lot of people have misconceptions among, like, left anarchists, mainly because... They don't understand the definition of capitalism being used. Oh, just to, just to let Michael know for a second, I saw his message pop up here that says uh, he's in... I, oh, he sent me on Facebook. Oh, okay. Anyway, um, Michael sent me a message letting me know that he's in uh, Cochise County, so that's that's great. Because that is definitely a county that we need to get on, on the ball there, so... I will definitely be reaching out to you, Mike. Appreciate you. Wonderful. Hell yeah. Well, was there anything else that you wanted to uh, talk about for convention weekend? I'm surprised you're not down at the after party right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about dropping and just seeing what the hell's going on. And then I got to do laundry, pack up, and uh, get the hell out of here in a few hours. Oh, yeah. Well, it's like 2 a.m. there, huh? Yeah, because i got to be out of here like 5, 6 is, 5 or 6 a.m. is when my ride's coming. So, But, yeah, I'll probably drink by there because, I mean, it's still going on, I know. Oh, is it? I'm pretty sure, usually. That would be, that would be sweet. I wish I could have stayed for, you know, just one more night. I just, I had to get back. My I'm actually a day late picking up, you know, my... Uh, my kids usually we do exchange on Sundays, and uh, so they stayed an extra day and missing them. You know, so I kind of want to yeah. get home, and spend the week with them. And luckily, Definitely. Arizona isn't requiring people to self isolate for fourteen days like New Mexico is, where I flew in. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, there's. There's Don't big yellow signs. There's big yellow signs all over the place when I flew into New Mexico. You know, uh, government is requiring that all individuals self isolate from you know other places when they fly into New Mexico. And I'm like, um, I'm just gonna go home. <laughs> yeah, just be safe and keep the kids safe. <laughs> oh yeah, I um, you know, I haven't had any symptoms. I haven't, you know. I've well, been. I was one of the. I was one of the people that was wearing a mask for most of the time that I was at the convention. You know, yeah. despite being accused of, uh, 
you know, murdering babies or whatever it was that, you know, people want to accuse me of online just for having the audacity to show up in person. Um, I, I mean, I, I so. yeah, you know, I wore a mask most of the time, you know, I, uh, I tried to wear a mask anytime I was on the floor of the convention hall, especially with Frank Robinson in front of me. Um, you know, I, uh, have a lot of respect for him and, I was surprised. Like, actually, people were a lot more respectful about shit than I figured. They yeah, would. well, and, and that's the beautiful thing about these conventions, and that's why I always like going to them, and I really hope that they don't go to an all-online future. Yeah, but the, I am really glad that we are making it more accessible and allowing online yeah. participation. Because, I mean, people are going to get sick. People with disabilities, people uh, who are poor are not going to be able to attend in person sometimes. Like, Yeah, definitely. You know, like, Or just people who are busy. Um, you but, know, it's, it yeah. makes it a little bit more accessible. I and, definitely you know, like that idea, idea of making it, you know? Yeah, I like the idea of it being accessible to more people on a you know broader range and a broader scale. Um, the part uh, what I don't want to see happen is it being switched to all online. Yeah, um, I think the in person or the in person part is important, and the people that didn't go this year that are complaining online that are you know calling us murderers and calling us like terrible people and saying that we're selfish and we don't care about anybody else. Like I didn't come, I didn't go to Orlando for me. It wasn't for my personal gain. It was for the gain of all of the efforts of all the things that I'm working on right now. And all the projects that I'm working on right now have very little to do with me personally. These are all issues that affect other people. Like, you know, I'm a business owner and I, I do okay. I'm not well off financially, but I, I managed to survive and take care of my kids. Um, you know, it's it was a it was a lot for me to go out of my way to make it to Florida, and I definitely don't personally benefit from anything out, you know, from there going on. I wasn't, I didn't get my Coke check or my Soros check by going out there. Still waiting in the mail for that. Um, I uh, didn't. You gotta you know, join Antifa. That's where the oh, money is. that's what it is. Okay, I, I yeah, I I didn't um, I didn't financially gain any. You know, I financially lost a lot actually going out to Orlando. But um, the networking that's done in person at these at those conventions, um, the amount of connection that happens there, the unity that happens, the the dropping of the online confrontational stuff that goes away. That's like, like you said, you know, we were all being shamed and told horrible things over the internet about our, us not wearing masks and things like that. But there were people there in person who were very, very hyper vigilant about their masks and mm -hmm. still were not sitting there and shaming other people who weren't wearing them and they weren't, you know, calling them terrible things. You know, like I had several conversations. Well, it's with also people. an uphill battle too with some people. It doesn't seem to really matter. You know, like they've got plenty of. You know, they have the government mm -hmm. and plenty of. You know, most of the population backing their position. It's, I don't know, but I would say it's an uphill battle. <laughs> um, it's it's more about that. Like what I saw, what I see in person is about the, you know what I expect. Like. I've had people like friends and family members that have like unfriended me on Facebook over the stuff that I said about masks and COVID-19 and like some of the controversial stuff that I've posted. Um, like I said, even though I wear a mask, I'm very critical of the policy and I'm very much a show me the data type person. Um, if you're not showing me facts and information that are leading you to conclusions that you're using to dictate what other people do, and I have I take serious issue with it, but beyond. But anyways, um, I I'm very much a, a show me the data person, and I haven't really seen data that really strongly signifies that masks are something that are effective. And I know I'm probably gonna get some kind of crazy backlash for even saying that online, but um, 
I've asked several of my local government officials just for information, you know, not confrontational, not trying to be a jerk about it. Um, just asking, you know, where is the data that shows that this is happening and this is the reason why it's spreading? Um, you know, not anecdotal, not stuff that just like, you know, like coincidence doesn't mean that that's what it is. You know, correlation is not causation. But, um, you know, where is the information that shows all this? Because all I've seen so far are news articles with very heavy-handed opinions um, and very little fact. And, you know, some of the studies that they're using don't even prove what they think it's proving. Um, and so, I, you know, I, uh, I think when it comes down to it and people get in person and, you know, it's the same thing like, when you go to a grocery store, you, you might see a person here or there that gets shamed or removed from a store and is shouting at the cashier because they get kicked out for not wearing a mask or whatever. You hear about occasional stuff like that, but it's not happening large scale. You know, the argument is mostly online from people standing on a virtual soapbox. And when they get in person, it's very different. You know, they're not on that soapbox anymore. And it's, it's a lot harder to want to sit there and firmly, like, push that kind of position on somebody in person. And especially, like, among libertarians, like, the people that showed up out there or the people who had considered the risks and knew what they were doing, or they, you know, they made, everybody that went out there made the decision for themselves to do it. Nobody was compelled or forced. Yeah, and, and so and the libertarians who wear anti-mask. I mean, I heard some grumble and complain, and you know, have to fumble and find a mask and shit. But uh, you know, even if they complained and wanted to protest, originally other libertarians would just calm them down and like just tell them to put on the fucking mask for a little bit and just walk through the lobby. Come on, and like usually that was enough to like get them to do that yeah and like i i noticed that even a lot of people that seem to be against mask wearing were still being respectful at the convention and wearing them when it was required you know like when they would walk into the hotel they're in walking through the lobby they'd wear it you know if they were in the elevators they would wear it um you know even like josh smith was out, was around wearing one today and that was a surprise to me because I hadn't seen it until now. Um, he was wearing one on the, yeah, on the delegate floor and everything. Yeah. And so, like, you see people, like, even myself, like, I argued intensely against, uh, you know, mask wearing, but I wore one for almost the entire convention. Um, you know, it's... To, to me, it's about that mutual respect and, and hoping that I can um, help ease people's fears so that they will look at the information. Man. Well, is there anything that you want to and, Huh? No, go ahead. Sorry. No. What were you, you going to say? I was just saying that, like, you know, the people that have been talking a lot about it online and saying, like, oh, my gosh, all these people at convention are going to get sick and die. And, like, we'll know in a couple of weeks who caught COVID from the convention and we'll know within a month who died from it, blah, blah, blah. And like, like, um, the doomsdayers, you know, like, I... While I understand that position, like, it's very much a position of fear, you know, like, it's it's coming from a stance of fear, like, a very few of the people that are espousing those things are people that are coming from it, from a, a calm and confident point of informed decision making. Um, well, I mean, is not fear sometimes justified based on fact? And I'm not saying it's necessarily justified right now, but I'm just like... No, of course. I mean, there's definitely like, 
there are definitely instances where data can freak you out. Um, but I guess where I'm at with this is that I've seen no data that is actually scary when you really look into it. Um, I've seen a lot of twisting or a lot of spinning of data or a lot of, you know, one-sided perspective of a study that um, what's that? Anyway, um, you know, that were you know, people saying that all of these, you know, numbers are, you know, like, like the big one is like the case numbers being on the rise, you know, how the big talk right now is all the case numbers are going up around the country. It's like, well, if I come out, you know, as I, I, I'm really big about numbers, I, I do math pretty well. Um, when I look at those numbers, I see something completely different. And but if I go around telling people that the numbers of what they're seeing, yeah, the numbers are going up, but it doesn't mean that more people are getting coronavirus. Um, it just, a lot of it means more people are getting tested. A lot of it means that um, people that weren't tested before are going to do it now. Like, there's a lot that goes into what those numbers mean. And even if you understand testing and how it works and the different types of tests that they perform to diagnose and to um, show that somebody has it, um, it's, it's so wide across the board that like, if you, even if you are somebody who does understand the testing, it's still, uh, it's still really complicated to make those numbers make sense. Um, and the fact that it's being used, that those numbers are instead being pumped out by the media and like in a way that like to me equates to fear porn. Um, I, I don't know. Like it's, I can't, I can't watch the news right now. Like I, I turn on the news and five minutes into it, I'm just sick. Like my stomach's turning and I have to turn it off. Man. And and it's like, I can understand why people are so freaked out if you watch a newscast. Like, if you sit down and watch one air. Or, you of, know, of just TV like, news. if you, you know, I mean, also, I guess I come from a lot of places, like, a lot of my friends are immunocompromised, like, in a lot of, and yeah. the thing is, is the more we don't always think about the ways that we spread shit mm -hmm. and we are getting more conscious of that, but like it gets really scary for some people and you can only yeah. isolate so much from everyone else when you still need basic survival thing, you know, basic and you know and, and in our rigged market system when people are when immunocompromised people are forced to work or starve you know like that's scary yeah you know so i mean there are different i don't know like there are very real no and and, and i definitely and, don't want to marginalize I, I definitely don't want to make people feel like I'm not um, sympathetic to that. I have, like, my father, who I take care of, is high risk. Um, he's diabetic. Is actually who I'm going home to right now. I get to actually, you know, scrub down and stuff before I even enter the house. But, um, you know, I try to make sure that I take precautions when it comes to dealing with him because I do, while I understand or while I, you know, have been saying that, like, I feel like the news has been very, like, fear-mongering about all of this, um, I do also understand that it is an actual virus. Um, you know, I know that it's a virus that exists. It does affect people. It does kill people. Um, if you are somebody who has immune 
you know, compromises who, you know, is HIV positive or is somebody who is diabetic or somebody who, uh, you know, for all of the various reasons that, uh, that are all of the various things that they've shown uh, put somebody in a high risk category. Um, all of those things, you know, my dad, like, marks off quite a few on that list. And, um, like, I, I definitely don't want to knock anybody that, like, I don't officer. Okay. Not for you, is it? No, nope, he's flying by the other direction. Um, okay, cool. I was like, oh, no, are you getting pulled over? No. Um, I... See, what, I'm sorry, what, what were we talking about there? Um, shit. I'm fucking high. I don't know. Oh, COVID. Yeah, okay. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. COVID. So, That's, yeah, again, I'm going to immunocompromise father. Yeah. yeah, I understand the very real fears that come along with it. But I still think the news is far overtaking it, and like the new, like watching an ep like watching one evening of CNN or MSNBC is enough to drive someone star grade fucking mad. Like it's, it's bad. Like I, I can't watch a whole newscast. It just starts making my head hurt and my stomach turn. Like I'm just like, oh my goodness. Like please stop, people. Like. I, like, I find myself shouting at the TV. It's like, no, nope, that's not what that means. No, nope, that's not how, no, that's not, stop, stop, it. you know. Like, yeah. It's this whole, like, like, you know, I wish one of these newscasts, when they're talking about, oh, we're going to, we want to talk about the spike in numbers in this area, or, you know, like, I wish they would talk about the type of testing that they're also doing in that area. And, why those numbers might you know they have no proof of why those numbers are spiking they want to say that it's because we're not wearing masks and we're not being vigilant about sanitary standards but then i have somebody i have a friend of mine who works she's very republican i will mention that right off the bat she's a total statist um but a friend of mine works for maricopa county's uh, in, you know she is the in Maricopa County Infectious Disease Medical Director. So she is appointed by, by you know, she's a, you know, a government official that um, they go to for information on infectious disease. And she was very, she made national news in March when she came out publicly against the governor of Arizona saying that schools should not have been closed and that we should not have shut down our economy. Now, this is back in March, and back at that point, this is somebody who's an expert in infectious disease. This is what she does, like her practice even, like this is what she does for a living is deal with people who have, infect, you know, are dealing with issues with infectious disease. She very publicly said that this virus is already at community spread everywhere. It's everywhere. It's already everywhere. The only difference is, is that we're finding out now. The tests are showing us increasingly that it's already everywhere. You know, there was a, something that I read in Reuters um, a couple weeks ago that was saying that they found it, they found the coronavirus in sewage samples from Spain from March of 2019. Yeah, they're still trying to figure out what exactly that means and whether it's the same exact strain now. When I right, that. but that's the but that's the point is that it may not even be the exact same strain. It might be an ancestral strain. Well, we we've already know there's ancestral strains. This isn't right. coronavirus, so I mean, and this won't right. be the last either. But well, I mean, we only we only know about the main types of coronavirus, you know, and, and we only know even about those now, thanks to the whole this whole this whole thing to begin with, is that you know people started getting angry and wanting information, so they started looking it up and 
And so like now everybody's a, uh, you know, an online expert. And <laughs> but it's, you know, there, there are so many strains of coronavirus out there that, you know, who's to say that there aren't strains that are almost identical, you know, that there aren't, that, you know, having this strain only um, sets you up for catching a worse version of it later on, and that's why we see people die from it, you know, I, there's so much that we don't know about it. Yeah, um, but I mean, we can follow the medical consensus without relying on the state's misinformation because, you know, I mean, the thing is, is the states largely hasn't been following. Most of the states have not been following medical advice. And, you know, we have evidence from what has worked in other countries and we can apply that here, you know, on a voluntary basis. But, I mean, yeah, masks, social distancing, hand washing, testing, quarantining. That'll, that works. You're cutting out again. Oh, man, we lost you. How long will it take for you to pop back in this time? I don't know. Anyways, my point for viewers is that, you know, it, it, it's like Mikhail Bakunin said, it's not when you want to talk about the matters of boots, you go to the boot maker. You know, it is authority based on knowledge, not authority based on power. Um, so, you know, you go to the people who are experts in those fields when you want knowledge in those fields. It's as simple as that. Um, looks like Alex is back. Um, but that was kind of my point is just code. Yeah. That Hey, well, hijack your own cells to make them reproduce the virus cells. And, and so it's no idea where you started. Even something that like is either that's really actively happening. Like you're breaking up and we lost most of that rant. Just so you know. Okay. You cut it in, in the middle of something. <laughs> and That's I have right. no clue. Was... And then you just keep breaking up. Yeah, I'm not sure what I was oh, saying. There you go. Where, where I, where I would have, I'm not sure where I would have cut out in there. So let's you know, leave it at that. But, well, um, hopefully, I guess what I really hope for is I hope that information comes out more information and I hope that our government is very forthcoming with that, that information. Yeah. I mean we do know we can't trust Fauci after his mask bullshit where you know he, he admits that he lied to us to stop a shortage. Which I mean I understand that motivation can be seen as altruistic but misguided but it still shows that he's not trustworthy. No. Bill shows that we should be willing to question. But I also think we can distrust him while trusting the basic consensus of medical experts based on what it has and has not worked in various countries. So, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah, masks, hand washing, distancing, quarantining for people who are sick and, and for people who have, you know, done shit. That all seems... Like, that's pretty easy to do voluntarily, and the rest of it, you know, we fucking figure out. We're constantly figuring out new shit. It's not like we know everything about this virus. Right. It's pretty brand new. So we do the best we can. We survive the best we can. We take care of each other, and we uh, provide mutual aid for uh, those most at risk. The best we can do. 
Was there anything else you wanted to talk about about the convention before we wrap up? Because I need to uh, start packing up and do some laundry before I head out. Do I lose you? Well, looks like we lost Alex. Anyways, folks, it has been absolutely wonderful to have y'all. I am getting tired and going to uh, do some laundry, pack up, and maybe get an hour of sleep before I get on the road. We'll see. Who the hell knows? Anyways, y'all, it has been good. This will uh, be uploaded to the YouTube channel, the Green Market Agorist YouTube and BitChute channels. Um, you can watch it there. And if you are watching it there, be sure to check out um, the original page. This was broadcast on Mike Shipley, Libertarian. Um, great friend of mine. Uh, sorry he couldn't make it to today's live stream. But, you know, I hope this isn't the last time that we do this. So, anyways, go subscribe to the YouTube and BitChute channel. Like Mike's page. And uh, let's say goodbye to Alex. Hey! <clears throat> you there? Alex. Wow. Well, let's see. And give him a few, a little bit longer to see if he responds. If he can actually. Oh, I heard a noise. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, there you uh, are. All right. Yeah, I was. Okay. Coming to a better spot of signal now. I'm now heading south of Holbrook towards Snowflake. Yeah. Well, I was just uh, I was just telling everyone that um, you know, unless you had anything else that you were going to talk about that you wanted to talk about about the convention or anything, I was just going to wrap. It up and uh, oh, the, the only. I think the only thing we didn't really touch oh, on was the yes, bank, we do which, want to talk uh, about that. Yes, why will I have you? Absolutely. Yeah, the uh, you know we had the was it the fourth biannual pizza, uh, parvitarian pizza banquet. Yeah, um, was a very big success. Um, did we? I believe that we had similar turnout to the turnout that we had in New Orleans. Which, Which is surprising, considering how many, how few people there were compared to, you know, New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we so in New Orleans we held it in the lobby of uh, what was that, the Hyatt, yeah, Agency Hotel or something like that. Yeah. Um. You know, we held it in the lobby there. Uh, we went through 30 pizzas in New Orleans. Um, this year, uh, we actually, you know, the pizzas we actually got this year were larger than the ones that we had in New Orleans, now that I think of it. So we may have actually gone through more pizza um, than <laughs> we did in New Orleans. Um, we went through 29 pizzas uh, last 29. night. And 29 pizzas. Um, including the first ever vegan options for the pizza banquet, you know, that we've not done before, but I, I agree that we should keep doing that. Those were delicious. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, and so, uh, honestly it was, they were a lot more popular than, you know, uh, than some folks were expecting, I think. And, you know, I saw yeah. some folks just curious to try it just because, um, but I also saw a lot of folks being respectful of the fact that there wasn't that much in leaving yeah. it to folks who, you know. But once all the other pizza was done, then it was fair game. Uh, yep. Yeah. And, uh, but I don't even think it lasted that long, actually. Uh, no, it really – well, yeah, it was 
Yeah, it was, it was gone pretty quickly after all, all the other regular pizza had disappeared. But, you know, then I had to order some more. Um, overall, I, like I said, I feel like it went really well. Um, I'm happy with some of the nods that we're getting from other caucuses and organizations within the party that I felt like would never give the time of day to Pavitarian. So, um you know, Josh, to hear Josh Smith talk about it, you know, in front of several people saying that he has, like, he very much supports what, what we do. Um, I had a lot of people that had no idea what a parvitarian was when they first saw the ribbon or when they first heard of the, par the party or they came to the party and got some pizza not knowing what at all it was about. Um, it was very encouraging to hear a lot of people you know, I, I didn't, there wasn't a single person that I talked to that didn't agree with what we were trying to do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of, you know, there were several people that were saying that, you know, th I noticed that we had several new signups on the page, on the Facebook page, for, you know, people liking the page or joining the group. And um, that's always great, you know, that always to me shows that, like, People want to be actively involved, and um, I think this poverty. I believe the Povertarian Caucus is it's it's a great bridge um, to you know invite people over from another aspect of it, or you know, maybe you know, totally outside of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Well, I have to get going and All right. get shit done. But you definitely have safe travels. I know you still got a little bit of a drive. Yeah, about forty-five minutes left, and I'll be home. Oh okay. yeah, that ain't too long. Sorry, I yeah. can't keep you company for a little bit longer. Yeah, no worries. Um, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you for coming on. And uh, we will have you on the Green Market Agorist podcast at some point to talk about, uh, well, your new position on the Jorgensen campaign and, you know, indigenous rights in general. And can't wait. So, everybody, uh, go subscribe and uh, check that out. Yeah, uh, oh, I guess I should drop some links uh, before we head out here. Uh, yeah. If you are interested in the Povertarian cause, uh, what we basically do is we are an organization that raises money to help pover to help impoverished and uh, those who have less of financial means to participate in our national conventions, the ability to do so. Um, and it's not just national conventions. If we, if we know somebody else that's in the group that's struggling, we've also reached out to help some people there as well. Um, but, the, but the main focus that we've done is to gather money to help provide a suite and room and board, you know, basically provide room and board for delegates that want to attend national convention who don't have the financial needs to make it happen. Yeah. Uh, and so... Uh, if you want to get involved with that or if you want to donate, you can go to the Facebook page at Povertarian Caucus. Um, it's you know, spelled like poverty mixed with libertarian. Um, you, know, you can go to Povertarian Caucus Facebook page. There's a group there. If you'd like to donate, you can donate at PayPal, which is the PayPal link is paypal.me. So paypal.m as in Mary. So paypal.me forward slash povertarians um and you can donate any amount you'd like there um we also again if you feel compelled to help with the navajo, Na navajo nation and their current crisis for running water you can donate to the navajo waters project at navajowatersproject.org uh, if you want to be involved in the Arizona State Campaign for Jorgensen, there is a Facebook page at Arizona for Jorgensen Co or Arizona for Jorgensen Cohen. Um, there's also the Arizona Libertarian Party Facebook page. There is the Arizona Libertarian Party website, which is at azlp.org. 
Uh, also, the national website, lp.org, if you want to get nationally involved with Jorgensen's campaign, is jo20.com. Um, and I think that's about all the links I can think of. Um, that should get people sufficiently connected if they are not already. Yeah. Get out there, get involved, and uh, have a good night, y'all. Go to fuck to sleep. Well, except for you. Alex, we gotta drive a little bit more. That would be dangerous. <laughs> but, uh, you don't gotta go home, but you can't stay here. Yeah, I am not gonna go to sleep. I am gonna be responsible and pack and uh, get on right the road on. later. So, cool. Catch you later, Alex. And uh, All right. good night, everybody. Catch y'all later, y'all. Huh. <sighs>